Hi, everyone. Just wanted to give it another a couple moments to get everybody a moment to get in. We're going to kick off very quickly here. So uh, welcome, everyone. My name is Melissa Dowry. Um, thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I am the executive coordinator here at McLeish Orlando, as well as the executive director of Bike Law Canada. Uh, just quickly, a little bit about Bike Law Canada. Um, so we are a network of bike lawyers that are across all of North America. Uh, we were represented in Canada and the US. Um, we are a network of cyclists and advocates who notice that there are a lot of flaws in our cycling system and want to see and make change. We ride within our communities, participating in various community events. Um, we participate with organi other organizations to seek change in our systems and our cycling systems and laws. Um, we've seen too many fatalities on our roads and we know that there is a lot that we can do to change that. Um, so today we are presenting the Bike Law Road to Recovery, Getting Back on the Bike. And we have a great panel of speakers joining us. Firstly, we have Patrick Brown. He is a principal partner here at McLeish Orlando. Um, he has worked in personal injury law for over 25 years and is an avid cyclist and dedicates time to advocating for cycling safety in Ontario. He initiated the coroner's review of Ontario cycling deaths, is the founder of Bike Law Canada, founding member and past director of Cycle Toronto, sits on the steering committee of Friends and Families for Safe Streets, and he leads the Vulnerable Road User Coalition. Pat will be speaking on advocating for the injured cyclist. Following Pat, we have Kyle Whaley presenting uh, the rehabilitation following a bike crash. Kyle's a physiotherapist and executive director at Propel Physio. He's been working in rehabilitation for almost 20 years and has spearheaded the use of cutting edge technology at Propel. Kyle enjoys cycling and being able to help people return to their love of cycling following an injury. And then last but not least, we'll be hearing from Anthony Smith. Anthony will deliver a firsthand account of what it is like to get back on the bike. Uh, he is a lifelong lover of cycling, is a member of the Lantern Rouge cycling team, and is also an urban planner focused on transit planning, formerly worked helping to design cycling infrastructure to improve road safety for all users. Very quickly, just a little housekeeping as well before we dive into it. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your Zoom control panel, found by clicking the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. We have allotted a few minutes at the end of the webinar and we'll respond to questions then. Depending on how many questions we get, we may go over a one hour mark. If you have to jump off, that is fine. Uh, we wanna be mindful of everyone's time. So I will let you know when we've reached one o'clock. Um, please feel free to stay if you can stay on till the end and join our Q&A or log on if you, off if you need to. Um, we're recording the webinar and it will be available on our McLeish Orlando website by the end of the week and we'll send everyone an email once it's been posted. So without further ado, I will pass things over to Patrick Brown. Thank you, Melissa. Um, welcome everybody. Um, part of my presentation is really from the legal side of uh, things and to talk to you a bit about um, bike laws and how it might impact the cyclists when they're facing a crash. I think cycling is obviously a positive thing. It's good for people. It's good for our communities. As they say, life is like riding a bicycle. To stay balanced, you must be keep moving. And we thought maybe with this presentation, the idea is to have a positive focus uh, on crashes. Uh, but there are some negative aspects that I have to address. And one of the things that I did want to share with you from my experience doing cases in involving cyclists, but also researching 
and participating in different things such as Melissa's already addressed, like the coroner's review, is that road violence is disproportionately targeting cyclists. And we know this because Public Health Ontario had done statistics uh, that showed that even though car on car crashes and people inside vehicles, the rate of injury and death was going down, the same wasn't being applied to pedestrians and cyclists. In fact, they were increasing. So after four decades of people and injury rates of people inside cars decreasing, we found that it was still increasing in relation to cyclists. And in fact, according to Public Health Ontario, 2,648 cyclists find their ways into emergency room departments every year following crashes. So who is causing cyclists to be injured or killed? And that was one of the things that we looked at during the coroner's review in order to get an understanding of what happened in these crashes, take the statistics and try to find some meaning in it. What was very clear is that the crashes involving injury to cyclists or fatalities were occurring by vehicles, whether it be trucks, cars, or other type of motor vehicles on our roadways. What we also found when we took a look at those crashes where a cyclist was killed, that in 62% of the cases, a driver did something that was illegal that would give rise to a conviction under the Highway Traffic Act. And that was in 62% of the fatality cases. And of course, that number is skewed because in many of those cases, we never heard the story from the cyclist. But what we did find out is 30% speeding, 28% driver inattention, 19% failing to yield, as well as other percentages. So from that, uh, you would think that the primary cause of cyclists getting hurt would fall upon drivers of vehicles. The unfortunate thing is when we did studies and took a look at Angus Reid polls, that when people were asked the percentage of who would be to blame when there is a conflict between a driver and cyclist, when a conflict exists without providing them any other information, the older population you got, the more prevalent that they felt that the cyclist was to blame. In fact, they had it backwards. So for instance, a 55 year old plus person when asked the question would say 75% of the time, it's a cyclist to blame, 25% the vehicle. As you get younger, you see the percentages changing, but it exists. And what exists is very apparent, it's bias. And it's bias against the cyclist after a crash. And that moves into our police, when they investigate crashes, clearly they're drivers as well. It permeates its way into our court system. The way our laws have been constructed, I believe have contained a portion of that bias, the way that they're written and they're auto-centric. Many of these cases and crashes involving cyclists involve juries. Insurance companies file, file jury notices to have that trial by jury because I believe they know that bias exists. It can also permeate into judges if they're drivers and never ride a bike. And of course, witnesses who see crashes, if they have that inherent bias, they may give a different story. So as a lawyer and helping cyclists in crashes and knowing what I know, I wanted to give some practical tips to everyone, hopefully to assist them that if this negative aspect of cycling does befall them, how to address it. So because bias may exist on investigation, but another important thing to remember is there's not a large amount of resources for a fulsome investigation by police of a crash scene involving a cyclist. Don't think that they are doing a CSI investigation. The resources don't afford it. The reconstruction, it doesn't allow it. At times they could have blinders because of that bias. And unfortunately, there's limited information on a crash scene and it might not be sufficient in order to prove that you weren't at fault and it was the driver's fault. It would be great if everyone had these cams on their helmets, but most people don't. We're not all, as they call it, cyborgs. 
And unfortunately, these are great, by the way, because they do capture exactly what happens. And I can int introduce that into court, but not everybody has that. So how do we deal with not everybody having a cam on uh, at a crash scene? Well, it's very important at the scene itself that the cyclists or their friends who are on the scene understand what has to be obtained. You have to firstly, obviously, if you're a cyclist, get out of the way, get to safety and ensure that you are safe. Also make sure obviously 911 is called, um, that the driver's insurance is taken. But what's really important is you wanna make sure if someone's on the scene and they got an iPhone, and generally there is, to take photographs of the scene, the bike, where the vehicle is, damage to the vehicle, the location of the bike on the scene, any street defects, if there's witnesses, it's very important to get their names and information. Witnesses seem to be lost if they're not found at the scene. They're very hard to relocate. All the stuff that you have on, preserve it, preserve your bike, all that is evidence. And if you're seriously hurt, obviously call a lawyer. If you are seriously hurt, and the reason that you have to collect that evidence is because you may have a lawsuit. And lawsuits are where you're seeking compensation for your injuries. And they can include having a claim for pain and suffering, loss of earning capacity, future care costs. If your injuries are significant, that could have a huge impact on you and your life moving forward and your family. So in lawsuits, we take a look at the insurance limits and it's really a claim against the driver or owner of the vehicle. You're looking, most people drive with auto insurance at about a million dollars. There may be other involved parties like municipalities based on the way that they develop infrastructure or fail to, and that could also access further amounts of insurance monies available. The likelihood of your case moving forward, if there is no municipality involved, is likely to be held by a jury, and the case itself is going to take years to complete. Now, in our system in Ontario, and I'm going to talk to you a bit about no-fault benefits in a second, but there, you still have the ability to sue. And you're able to sue if you have or meet certain criteria in relation to your injuries. But essentially, you have to have serious injuries uh, that do have some permanency in order to really advance a claim for what's called pain and suffering and care costs. Um, in that system, you have to prove fault, meaning you have to prove that the other party was responsible. Now, what they did to help cyclists under the Highway Traffic Act is they did what was called a reverse onus. And so instead of the cyclist having to prove that the person driving the vehicle did something wrong, it's flipped. And in fact, the person driving the vehicle, if they hit a cyclist, must prove that they were driving reasonably. It's a slight evidentiary thing that we use in court, but it does exist as to whether or not juries understand it, it's questionable but it is one assistance that the law does give cyclists when there is a crash. Now, in every crash, even though you can determine fault against the driver, maybe it's a right hook, running a stop sign, overtaking you, clipping you, whatever it is, they can also make arguments what's called contributory negligence in order to reduce their exposure by saying the blame lies on the cyclist. And again, back to collecting evidence on the scene is so important in order to negate those type of arguments as well. And lastly, they could assert a helmet defense. If the cyclist wasn't wearing a helmet, they can assert that defense. Now, that's a tough defense to advance and very few, if any, cases have ever been successful on that defense. Because in order for them to be successful, they have to prove that the helmet would have significantly reduced the injuries involved. So if you had a pelvic fracture and you didn't have a helmet, it wouldn't matter. Secondly, they also have to have medical evidence to satisfy that it would have made a substantial change. And that means they have to call medical evidence from an expert to that degree. It's just something I wanted to share about the defenses you face. Now, in getting a fair and reasonable result, which is the goal of any lawsuit, just remember as a cyclist, many are stoic, you're super human at times, and you grind through things, you buck up. But in a lawsuit, it's very important that you report all your symptoms on a regular basis. That way, no one can assert that those weren't from this crash. Secondly, just be honest throughout the whole process. I tell all clients, honesty, honesty, honesty.
don't listen to Joe the neighbor. Joe the neighbor may have had a crash or knows someone, but every case is different and Joe could give you some very bad advice. Medical experts are key. On any case to build it up, you need medical professionals in order to provide opinions that will support your case. Future care cost experts will be used in order to assess what you will need into the future so that evidence can be before court. And from time to time, we use engineers to prove crash scenes, but we also use forensic accountants to prove your loss of earning capacity. The last portion is you also have benefits and benefits are available to you regardless of fault and are outside the lawsuit system. They come from the insurance company. They could come from your own auto insurance if you have a policy or the driver that struck you. Here's just a quick list of who's entitled to insurance benefits when they've been involved in a crash on a bike. If a cyclist gets hit by a car, yes, benefits are available. If a cyclist hits another cyclist, no benefits are available. If you crash on a trail, no benefits are available. If you hit a parked car, yes, you can get benefits. If you're doored, yes, you can get benefits. If a car, if you swerve to avoid a, a car or a door, yes, you can get benefits. And then if you just crash on the street and it's caused by some debris or an oil slick, you may be able to get benefits depending on whether or not the lawyer would connect it to a vehicle involved somehow. Anyways, that's a quick overview of who gets benefits. The benefits that are available are from normally your own insurance. Even though you're on your bike, the first application would go to your car insurance if you have it. If you don't have insurance available, then it goes to the vehicle that struck you. And then if they don't have insurance, and then, and there's no insurance available, it can go to what's called the motor vehicle accident fund. But no matter what, there will be benefits available to you. The nature and extent of those benefits really depend on the nature and extent of your injuries. And they have a category, minor, non-catastrophic and catastrophic. Just to give you a brief understanding, minor injuries, you only get $3,500 of medical and rehabilitation treatment. If you're catastrophic, you get a million. These benefits are available to you, but there could be other ones such as CPP, short-term disability, long-term disability from your employers. Part of those benefits, we're gonna hear a little bit about some of the treatment you can obtain as a cyclist from Kyle, uh, but they can include uh, modifications or things in relation to your damaged bike or getting you back on a bike with certain modifications. Anyways, that's my talk. I touched on some points that I think would help you as a cyclist in a crash from a legal perspective. I couldn't hit everything, but I hope it helps. And I'm gonna turn it over to Kyle for the more positive aspects of getting you better and back on your bike. Thank you. Thanks, Pat. Great to be here today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what the rehab journey might look like after a cycling accident. Please keep in mind that uh, not all cycling accidents are the same, obviously. They can go from cuts and scrapes to more significant stuff like a spinal cord injury. I like to start with a couple of quotations, play off what Pat presented. There's something about getting on a bike that's just incredible. I'm a cyclist in the city and um, the adrenaline rush and the feeling of, of freedom as I'm biking around the city is it's second to none. Uh, unfortunately, that freedom uh, can come with a risk. Uh, and being in a bike accident, we, we see lots of different types of injuries. Some, as I mentioned, more significant, including spinal cord injury, amputation, significant brain injury, mild traumatic brain injury, concussion, fractures, or hopefully just sprain strains and maybe a scrape. Uh, we have access to some of the best acute medical care here in the world in Canada, which we're very fortunate for. If you get injured and significantly injured and require acute emergency services, you're likely going to end up at one of our acute care centers, St. Mike's or Sunnybrook. Um, <clears throat> again, hopefully not, but the worst case scenario, you, this may involve some of the injuries I spoke about. And physiotherapy, your journey early on in an acute care phase is, you know, initially keeping you alive. And then certainly from a physiotherapy point of view is early mobilization. We want to get people moving, getting them sitting at the edge of the bed and preparing to transfer. Again, that depends on the type of injuries you've had. And you may be discharged home for there, from there, excuse me, <clears throat> or you may be on your 
way to rehab if you have more significant injuries. And our rehab centers in Toronto are ones like uh, Lynnhurst, a rehab center for spinal cord injuries, St. John's, Bridgepoint. And your stay there also may be dependent on your injuries. It could be a, a couple of weeks up to really a couple, two or three months, depending on how you're progressing. And from a physiotherapy perspective, you're working more on functional goals, starting to get moving again. You, maybe you're using a mobility device. Maybe you're not a walker. You may be in a wheelchair if it's more significant and preparing to return home. So what does home look like? How am I going to negotiate stairs? And I think the important thing here is <clears throat> the beginning of uh, working in a team environment. So all good, all rehab facilities have a great uh, collection of um, a comprehensive group of rehab team, which usually includes physiotherapy, occupational therapy, social work, your whole physician team, um, and a number of others. And that's really important. We don't work in isolation. And lastly, should you go through acute care and rehab or just be discharged straight home, uh, you, you end up in the community and that could be outpatient rehab in a public hospital, or it could be a private clinic like we run. Um, and that kind of rehab, depending on your injuries, again, could be weeks and up to years. And uh, it starts with a comprehensive assessment. And again, what we're doing is we're building off of those early goals you may or may not have had in rehab that are functional. Walking, running, getting people back to activities of daily living, getting people uh, preparing back to work or employment. <clears throat> it may involve learning to walk again. Um, uh, the picture here uh, is, is myself with a colleague of mine doing a vestibular rehab technique. Sometimes after a bike accident, you end up damaging your vestibular system, which could cause vertigo, or dizziness. And again, we may be working on that. It's really dependent on your specific presentation. And most importantly, in the community, we work in a collaborative team. So having a, a team and good communication between occupational therapists and rehab support workers and the physicians uh, is really, really important. I do have a video here, not sure if it'll, sure if it'll play, but some of the things we may be using here at, at Propel. Oh, it does, great. On the left, we've got a body weight support system. Um, this is a gentleman using that, as well as our robotic assisted walking system. So if you have trouble with your balance or mobility and it requires extra support, this may or may not be appropriate for you. And on the right, we have a gentleman using uh, a new device we have uh, called the PONS. And it's a neuromodulation device. Essentially, it goes on the tongue and it stimulates the nervous system and primes it for learning. And this gentleman's using it after, uh, excuse me, he's uh, practicing balance. What are some of the challenges in rehab after a bike crash? <clears throat> we talk about this often in early discharge from a hospital. Pat addressed it a little early on. Um, one of the challenges we get sometimes is we, we have people walk in after a bike crash and you know they've been to the eMERGE and, and you know they said, somebody looked me over, I had a CAT scan, everything was clear. Uh, but there's really, sometimes there's no direction for follow-up and that can be really challenging. You don't have a diagnosis um, and, and clients aren't sure what to do. And they end up with coming to see us sometimes after many months They've gone on to develop significant symptoms after a concussion or a mild traumatic brain injury. Fear of being in an accident or getting hit again is, is significant in our population. People are really scared and you know, bike crashes are traumatic. Nobody wants to get hit on their bike, especially on the road and by another vehicle. Balance challenges may limit your ability to ride and visual and perceptual challenges as well. Pat talked about this, cyclists are a, a special bunch and they love getting out on the road and they love getting riding, riding again. And one of the challenges can be getting them back on the bike and holding them back really. 
you know, and making sure they're prepared from a strength, a balance and a mobility perspective um, to be able to get back on the road again. And what does that look like when we get people back on the road? It, you know, your, your new bike or, or the bike you were riding may look totally different. It could be a two wheel bike. It could be a hand cycle of all different sizes and shapes, and it could be a three wheel bike or a trike. I'll finish off with a with a success story here, and this is a case we had a handful of years ago. It was a 21 year old girl who was hit while she was riding her bike and had a significant traumatic brain injury, multiple fractures in the lower legs and pelvis and collapsed lung. Um, she spent a couple of weeks in the ICU, six weeks in rehab at Bridge Point, and then she was discharged in the community and ended up working with us at Propel uh, for the better part of two years. <clears throat> Her, her major deficits were dizziness and vertigo, and the sense of the room spinning, balance challenges, instability at her knee, um, and a lot of the stuff that goes along with traumatic brain injury. So significant fatigue and perceptual and visual challenges. And her goal was to get back on her bike. She was halfway through her undergraduate degree and her goal was to get back on her bike and finish at U of T. And she actually lived out here in Etobicoke, not far from the clinic. Um, we were working in a community-based team that included OT and PT and social work, rehab support work, massage, kinesiology. And, um, you know, she was coming two to three times a week for a really long time. The stages of healing are a lot different. This isn't like spraining your ankle. When you get polytrauma and a brain injury like this, the rehab journey is long and full of ups and downs. But in the end, uh, her goal was achieved. At uh, just after two years, she ended up um, biking all the way down to U of T and having a full day of classes and biking home. That's it. At, that's it on my end. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Anthony. Great. Thanks, Kyle. Uh... Nice to hear positive outcomes, uh, and I'm happy to say I'm a, a lucky survivor as well. So it's certainly a sobering topic, but I do want to focus on the positives as well and uh, share a little bit about my journey. And uh, I'll just start off with kind of what it was like before. Uh, so as the bio intro started off with, cycling has been a big part of my life since this is I think grade 10, I was in the, not only worked in a bike shop, but worked, uh, trained on mountain biking in Ontario and was fortunate enough to be one of uh, the Ontario Cup winners at one race, my highlight of my cycling career. It was a, an amateur race, certainly not a pro level, but um, really enjoyed cycling my whole life. And if you go to the next slide, uh, I grew up, still love cycling. And uh, this was taken just a few months before my crash, which was three years ago. And down in Niagara, uh, long rides, mostly road riding, but I also still do triathlons and mountain bike racing and, and all sorts of riding. And just for anyone interested, the GO train to Niagara is coming back this weekend. So get out and enjoy that long ride. Uh, next slide. Just uh, on a professional note, to say um, my career, I'm an urban planner, so I focus on land use and urban design. But because of my interest in healthy and active living, uh, I really decided to focus my career on transportation and specifically started off working at a consulting firm designing cycling infrastructure. So I have both a personal and a professional interest in this. This was a, a MTO project designing a province-wide cycling network, for example. So really trying to connect communities, build safe, protected cycling infrastructure, and um, you know share the road as, as the saying goes with with motor vehicles. But uh, this is not a professional talk, so I'll focus on my journey. Uh, next slide. I, I really do want to say that the why of kind of my my purpose in professional planning is building infrastructure for everyone. So ages six to to hundred, if they're able to ride 
these young kids in Vancouver riding on a protected cycle track. And it doesn't mean we have to take road space away from vehicles. We can make safe trails and, and protect uh, people with bollards and other physical infrastructure. So this is really the, the ideal situation. I'm really happy to see Toronto moving along. I do want to give a shout out I'm wearing my bike month shirt. And I know there's some folks here from Cycle Toronto and some other advocacy groups. So just uh, big kudos to all the work that those folks do to, to promote cycling in our city. It, it does help promote uh, recovery in my personal journey, knowing there's a community of folks out there. Next slide. And I'll, I'll just say this briefly, but it's uh, the next slide shows my personal journey is also cycling focused. Um, next slide shows my little dinner table Valentine's card. And uh, if you go to the next slide, my wife and I both found each other through cycling. So this is Stephanie and having her in my recovery was probably one of the biggest parts of the journey that helped me um, as well as part of this Lantern Rouge cycling team. So I have a really strong community of, of friends who helped me get back on the bike, encouraged me and that social support has been uh, critical to my recovery as well. And next slide. So just to see, this is kind of the sport that we do. It's called cyclocross. It's an off-road, uh, small course, kind of like mountain biking, but on a road style mountain bike or off-road bike. It's a, kind of a fun sport, great for spectators. So if you're able to watch, please come out and cheer us on sometime. Uh, next slide. But really beyond the, the bike, I just want to say that it's a social sport. We hang out, we spend time together and, uh, you know, coffee breaks are just a big part of the riding experience. So next slide. Um, don't want to dwell on this, but just to say my experience, uh, the next slide shows my, uh, crash, which happened about three and a half years ago. I was riding up to Midlands from Toronto and unfortunately crossing through Barrie. Uh, going down a hill, this pickup truck decided to turn illegally at the last minute right in front of me. And as you can see, I crashed into the side of the vehicle. So that turn not in safety was a very big mistake on the driver's part. And uh, the next slide shows the injuries. Uh, my helmet shattered. Essentially, I bounced under the vehicle. Thankfully, didn't get crushed. Um, but it was a very serious injury. And lucky I had the helmet, but uh, next slide shows that I was taken to um, emergency in Barrie and had very good care, thankfully, from police and ambulance on the scene to the transportation and, and CT scans and all that. Uh, next slide. Uh, I was transported to Sunnybrook where I had uh, orthopedic assessment essentially had surgery the same day. They installed a uh, C-spine fusion, three vertebrae basically bolted together and reduced the mobility I have in my neck, but uh, some you know, adjustments I, I'm able to, to function to a very fortunate extent. Uh, so next slide. And after a few weeks in hospital, uh, again, very fortunate to have the support of my friends and family. Um, Stephanie was, was there along the way. And uh, next slide. Just to say the, I got very mad very quickly. And thankfully at the same time, there were some advocates pushing for some legal changes to protect cyclists in a more substantial way, modifying the Highway Traffic Act. So I started a petition. It was very, uh, actually, inspired to have, I think, a, I'm up to about 25,000 now, but at the time of this screenshot, 16,000 people signed this, and there's still a lot of work to do, but uh, Pat and his team at Bike Law and Cycle Toronto are, are all advocates for this type of change in our society. So, uh, next slide. Um, this is where I really wanted to just pivot. Next slide. Um, talk a little bit about specifics in my recovery journey. So as I've mentioned, I went, got the surgery at Sunnybrook, 
Um, but in terms of the team, I think to echo some of what Kyle said, I had the occupational therapist uh, in place right at the start. And actually, I should back up one sec. So I was at um, Sunnybrook, then I was discharged to Bridgepoint. And Bridgepoint's an incredible facility, uh, world-class, you know, overlooking the, the Don Valley, great team. And at that point, I also reached out to Patrick Brown's team, had very, uh, came very highly recommended from about four different cycling contacts. And he uh, took me on as a client. One of the first things they did was set up uh, accident benefits so that I could start to access treatment plans had an uh, occupational therapist, and I didn't know what that was at first. Honestly, it never even occurred to me that I would need one, but they helped out with all the modifications I needed at home and set up all the paperwork, so really a massive amount of work behind the scenes to get, get everything rolling, and connected me with physio and massage therapy. Uh, they set a treatment plan up. And that, that helped me tremendously as I was re returning to work and getting back into trying to be physical after recovery. Uh, I also worked with a chiropractor. And really importantly, at first I wasn't interested in social work. I thought, you know, the main, that I'm tough, I can push through this. You know, the mental health aspect of this recovery is, is really the hardest part. I, you know, your body gets better, the bruises go away. But psychologically dealing with the trauma both the kind of flashbacks and sensory experiences that you just walking on the street, you hear a loud noise and you jump. It's very traumatic and longer term, just kind of level setting your goals and learning how to get back to a normal life or adjusting to a new normal. Uh, having a social worker really helped through that journey. And uh, in addition, I had my family doctor, uh, ongoing contact with physiatry because I had some nerve damage in my hands as well and some uh, support from the pain clinic at Toronto Rehab which is a very specialized kind of a integrated clinic that connects a lot of the dots and helps you get back to uh, prime or peak health as best you can. So I had a really good team and I wanted to say that the lawyers are essential to coordinating all this and it, it sounds funny I never thought of this from the start but Having Patrick's team and their ability to organize everything, keep the paperwork organized, contact the adjuster for accident benefits, and uh, it is a struggle at times to get things approved. And ultimately, there's a lot of waiting. Sometimes getting a treatment plan submitted takes two or three weeks, and it feels like an eternity when you just want to get a massage and try to take the pain away. Um, but the, the whole team support really, really made it work and ultimately got a lot of the, the testing done that I needed to support the, uh, the lawsuit after the fact. And I couldn't have done this without, without Patrick's support, so really grateful for their, for their whole team. Uh, you can go to the next slide. And just to say the kind of in closing, the goal is, is often quite far away. And the idea, even just the lawsuit process, can take uh, you know, three to four years. It's, it's painfully slow at times when you just want to move on with your life. And I, I will say one of the most challenging parts of going through this journey is you have to keep reliving it. And even as an advocate, I, I'm willing and happy to share my story, but it does take a toll. And, you know, it is, it's a struggle to kind of keep reliving, telling your story and pushing for change. Um, you kind of have to pace yourself. So just like in any good climb, this is a beautiful climb up to a point in Mallorca in Spain, uh, famous cycling climb. It takes time and you just have to be, enjoy the ride, try to make the most of every day. And finally, uh, last slide. This is just, uh, it's actually <laughs> from before the crash, but we are able to do short rides again. I'm not anywhere near where I was in terms of those 300 kilometer rides, but I can ride to Oakville, do a short. 30, 40 kilometers, and uh, still enjoy pastries and coffee at the end of the ride. So lucky to be here and uh, willing to answer any questions that folks may have. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Anthony. Um, just very quickly, before we dive into Q&A, I wanted to um, 
to address a couple of things. Anthony touched on vulnerable road user laws. You saw that he had shared a petition um, that he had gotten many signatures on. This is an, an initiative that um, we have been working towards for quite some time. Um, earlier in Pat's presentation, he had mentioned that 62% of all cyclist fatalities are caused by a driver's actions, whether it be speeding, inattention, or failing to yield, among, among other infractions. However, of that 62%, only 23% are actually charged. Um, we found this information out in um, the cycling death review that Patrick and his colleague Albert Cole had initiated. Um, so only 23% of those are charged. And it may be easy for some to assume that these penalties and these charges are meaningful. After all, a life has ended, someone has been killed, a family has been altered forever. However, that is actually not the case. These are just some examples of people we have represented over the years. Um, starting on the left, we have Ryan Carrier. Um, he was a father. Um, on his way home that evening to take a son trick-or-treating, a, a truck had made an unsafe turn, um, dragging him into the undercarriage of the vehicle, and that driver was charged with turn not in safety. Um, his fine was $85. Ryan was killed. Um, Eduardo LeBlanc in the center there, he was cycling in Scarborough in October of 2014 when a driver ran a red light and hit him, killing him instantly to the point where his organs weren't even salvageable for donation. Um, that driver was fined $700. Uh, Bruce Tushingham was killed in Markham while cycling. Uh, that driver was charged for unsafely leaving the roadway. She did not attend court. Um, to hear the family's tearfully crafted victim impact statements. The family actually read it to an empty chair. Um, her agent attended court on her behalf and pled guilty for her, and she was charged $500. And then lastly on the bottom, this is Dugolf Christie. He is a lawyer that was cycling across Canada, raising awareness for access to equal legal assistance. Um, he was struck and killed by a van on a dangerous stretch of the Trans-Canada Highway. He was coming from Vancouver and was killed in Sault Ste. Marie uh, just days before his final destination in Ottawa. Um, this driver's particular charges were withdrawn in court. So these are just some very quick examples. They're not one-offs. They are, they happen all the time. Um, so just some other quick examples here of some low fines and penalties. $60, $85, all across the board. So this is an example as to why we need vulnerable road user laws. I can tell you that they're not one-offs, they happen all the time. And the objective of a vulnerable road user law is to first and foremost, bring justice and closure to families, to create a public awareness campaign and deterrence for drivers, and to ultimately reduce the fatalities and injuries on our roadways. Um, so what a, a vulnerable road user law is, is that any driver who is convicted of an offense under the HTA, which results in the injury or death of a vulnerable road user, is subject to these added penalties, meaning increased monetary fines, mandatory probation order, which would require a driver to take a uh, driving instructing course and perform community service in relation to road safety. Um, until those courses are completed, their license would be suspended and a mandatory appearance in court to hear victim impact statements. So this is something that we've been pushing for for quite some time. Uh, we have formed a coalition with these organizations you see on your screen, among others. I think we have a lot of participants as well in our uh, joining us today. I know Friends and Families for Safe Streets is here. I know Cycle Toronto is here. Thanks guys for joining us. Um, if you are a part of an organization that would like to join our coalition, please just reach out to us at the end of our presentation. We are more than happy to add more organizations to our coalition in support of vulnerable road user laws. And lastly, if you are a, an individual, um, and I encourage all of you to reach out to your MPPs, ask for them to advocate for vulnerable road user laws. It has been a bill that has been tabled many times. Um, currently, it is Bill 62. 
um, and we are constantly advocating to have the, this legislation passed and change our Highway Traffic Act. Really quickly, one last thing is I wanted to shout out Friends and Families for Safe Streets. We are a support and advocacy organization. Pat and myself both sit on the committee among um, other members such as Jessica Speaker, who I believe is joining us today as well. Um, this is their contact information and our Twitter and Facebook at FF Safe Streets. We offer support group meetings to victims of road violence. They are only for victims of road violence um, and we host those monthly. So um, if, you if you know of anyone that is in need of any kind of support, this would be the organization to reach out to. And uh, we're gonna dive into some Q&A now. It, again, just to remind everyone, if you do have a question, please write it in the Q&A uh, portion in your screen, at the bottom of your screen there. We had a couple that were mailed in ahead of time. So I wanted to touch on those firstly. Um, I can answer this one very quickly and then I'll pass it off to Patrick Brown to touch on the rest. Um, so someone asked if the manufacturers of helmets can have a sticker inside of them with instructions on how to wear a helmet properly. Uh, for this, we know that there are many stickers and labels in the helmet that um, indicate that they meet our safety standards. However, there isn't anything that indicates how to fit them properly. Um, but a very good rule to go by is the 2v1 rule, which is two fingers here, your helmet should meet the V on the side of your helmet where the straps would sit, and the one finger under the chin strap should fit nice and snugly there. So that's a, a good uh, way to remember it and a good way for children to remember it as well. Um, in terms of stickers inside the helmet, um, it has been said that stickers can actually degrade the foam of your helmet. So I, I'm wondering if that's the reason for not having the instructions inside, but 2v1 is a very simple rule to go by. And I'm just gonna pass the other question over to Patrick Brown. Yeah, thanks, Melissa. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's, those are great presentations. One of the questions that came in in the queue before we started was, can you recommend a source for statistics on bike accidents, cause, type of injury, road conditions, et cetera? Um, if you go to the, the cycling death review that Albert and I initiated and, and sat on, you will see in that death review, they have a lot of statistics in relation to bike crashes, um, the causes and the, um, in those cases, they were fatalities, but the statistics include rates of injuries. So that is one place where not only will you have some statistics, but it will direct you to other statistics. There's obviously stats can, there's some Toronto police services. In fact, there's a lot of other statistics out there. And if you're really, really interested in all the stats, I, I do have a, a database that I'm more than happy to share with you, especially uh, if you're advocating for cycling safety to share with you if you want uh, that I've collected over the years. But the, these are just some some limited ones. And in fact, I mean, the, the next question was, where, where are people getting hit? And uh, really, the vast majority, just so you know, two thirds are in urban centers as opposed to rural. Uh, the vast majority are near intersections. Um, obviously, as we many of us know, that um, arterial roads um, the one statistic that's not in there about uh, where these are happening is, is they're happening where people are speeding. Uh, we all know um, one of the number one things that results in someone being killed is the speed of the vehicle. And the percentages drop dramatically the slower the vehicle. And there's a lot of stats on that. This is just, I think, one of the fatal traffic collision maps that kind of identifies some hot zones in um, Toronto, in the surrounding area. Um, a lot of these information is, it, over the years, I, I have to say, um, have been collected by people as opposed to um, our governments. I mean, a lot of this was started off by ARC, or the Advocacy for Respect for Cyclists. Uh, Martin Reese has always had a collection of trying to identify where hot areas are. Starting to get better, and we're getting more information, obviously. And Strav and some other things are also trying to start collecting more, but that's just one map of fatal traffic collisions. So I think 
Melissa, am I correct? That, that's kind of the, the questions that were in the queue and we're more than happy to take any other questions, Kyle, myself, Anthony, Melissa. We do have some questions in the Q&A that we'll dive into. I think, um, Pat, the first one, I might open it up to the floor, but I'll see if you can do it here. So um, do we know of any experts who are able to address claims involving bike collapses where the injury is caused when the bike falls apart while riding it in a normal yeah. manner? Yeah, uh, I, I've never done that case, just so you know. But in bike law, when we meet, we meet about once a year, um, usually down in the United States. And many of those bike lawyers have had collapsible forks and things like that. And there are various engineers um, that can be used in relation to that type of crash or where the, there's a collapsing or, or, or what we might refer to as well as product liability in relation to the nature of the bike itself. Um, it's usually forensic engineering. They'll do forensic testing. Um, I use some engineers out of uh, BC as well here in Ontario that if you are looking for somebody, I can refer you to them. That's, that's no problem. But there's, there's, there's people out there, forensic engineers that do that and forensic testing. Okay, great. Um, the next question again would be for you, Patrick, coming from Wilson. In the event of a collision between a cyclist and a car where the cyclist sustains an injury, who is responsible for the cyclist's legal fees? So um, where a cyclist is injured after a vehicle strikes them, at the end of the case, if the cyclist is successful in their lawsuit, meaning they, they've been awarded some damages, then the driver's via, the driver, who in fact is his insurance company that respond, also has to pay a portion of what's called cost or a portion of the legal cost. So those fees, a portion of them are paid by the driver's insurance company. But the vast majority of people who handle cases involving serious injury or death will do those cases on a contingency basis so that the actual injured cyclist or the family who lost a loved one is not charged ever until the end of the case and only if there's success. Great. Um, and the next question, how does this legal information apply to other vulnerable road users such as skateboarders and e-scooter riders? What are their rights in case of a crash? Uh, I, I think that uh, with e-scooters and skateboarders, I mean, they have certain rights and they certainly have the right not to be hit by, by vehicles or other cyclists or anybody. It's really a question back to is someone at fault and were they negligent? And so if you're on a skateboard or an e-scooter and somebody hits you and, and they were doing something improper or illegal or negligent, then yeah, you can sue them just like a cyclist could sue them. So they have the same rights. Um, in relation to the vulnerable road user legislation, it includes all vulnerable road users. So that legislation includes pedestrians, cyclists, people who use mobility aids, um, skateboarders, and other road users. So the, the, the actual legislation tries to encompass those as well, the proposed legislation. Um, next question. Have you found that the introduction of cycle tracks have assisted in reducing the amount of cycle accidents? I could actually leave that to Anthony because he's, he's a tra he might know as a transportation planner. Um, do you think cycle tracks and bike lanes and, and, and those type of infrastructures um, reduce injury and death? <clears throat> uh, it's a good, good question. I certainly do. I, I don't have any statistics handy on on the topic, but I know, you know, in principle, it's it's reducing the exposure between cars and, and reducing the mixing of vehicles on the roadway. So, you know, I think on average, it just means that people and bikes don't mix. The, the biggest challenge is that intersection where there's still a majority of crashes occur where in Toronto, for example, cars turn right and they, they clip a bike. Um, so there, there's still a lot of danger points outside of the protected infrastructure, but uh, certainly physical barriers, things like bollards or concrete curbs or a vertical uh, change between the cycle track and the road, those are substantially more effective than just paint. And that's one of the challenges. Um, you know, it's often quicker to paint a line, but, but it doesn't stop a car. So at the end of the day, we really do need proper physical barriers. And uh, that's 
often more challenging to implement, but I think we're starting to see a, a momentum shift in Toronto and hopefully get lots more built. Great, thank you. Um, we are just shy of, oh, there it is. We're at the one o'clock mark. Um, I don't have any more questions in the Q&A, so I'm just gonna do a quick last call for any other questions from anyone. Just, just while you're doing that, Melissa, Michael Longfield certainly is, is, is put out on the chat there, and I don't know if everybody accesses that, if they do, but some additional statistical data in the US and Canada from outsideonline.com, uh, which is tracking cycling deaths each year. So thanks, Michael, so much. I see Barry Cox is also here. Hi, Barry, uh, I hope you're well. Barry's a lawyer as well, and deals with a, a lot of different cases and has been and is a very active cyclist. Uh, so I just wanted to I see you there, Barry. Barry also had to say hi to my dog. So just wanted to. <laughs> Also, just to say that emotional support animals, truthfully, part of the recovery, I did get a dog. Uh, it actually made a huge difference, that constant companionship and physical activity from walking. I spent the first year of recovery just walking and walked for five, 10 kilometers some days. So um, yeah, dogs help. It's a real part of the journey. Uh, we got another quick question here from Andrea for the submission of OCF 18s looks like it should first be submitted to the cyclists auto insurer. Uh, that, that's correct. That is correct Andrea. Okay, so on that note, it is now 101 i'm not seeing any further questions coming into the Q and a. Um, so we will close off on that. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending. And a special thank you to our guest speakers, Anthony and Kyle. We really appreciate having you here today. A um, couple takeaways for everyone. Um, reach out to your MPPs about vulnerable road user laws. If you are part of an organization that wants to be part of our coalition, please reach out. Um, follow us on our social channels. They're posted on your screen here for Propel, Anthony, Bike Law, and McLeish Orlando. Um, and we, once again, will be recording this power, this presentation and sharing it. So please feel free to share with your communities and uh, new cyclists and any advocates out there that you know of. Um, thanks again for joining us, everyone, and we will see you next time.